Welcome to this lecture. This is a lecture focusing on amphibians and reptiles and birds and their impacts on stream ecology. And up until this point, we've covered now macroinvertebrates, we've covered fishes. We haven't spent time talking about these other groups. And I'm going to lump them together, not because they're not important, uh, but because these are very, very large animals and they tend to be very rare in many systems. So while they still have many important effects on stream ecology, we don't see their abundance like you will in other systems uh, with things like macroinvertebrates. All right, so before you finish this lecture, hopefully you'll be able to explain what the title actually means. I want you to be able to discuss some general characters of these groups and their effects on streams. And I want you to, to make sure that you appreciate what is an important component of stream systems are these other groups that I find generally get overlooked in many cases, and I don't think that's fair. All right, so why does why did I have this weird tongue-in-cheek title to this uh, lecture? First off, we need to figure out how amphibians are related to us. Amphibians are actually a group of highly derived lobe fin fish that are pretty aquatic, so they're over here. These are all amphibians. Here's what we think of as a traditional fish occurs over here, all right? Our own group is here, and then birds and reptiles sit over here, okay? So amphibians are their own thing. They're still very, very cool organisms. They are far more fish-like in many cases than we think of uh, for many other groups. They really need to breed in very, very moist environments. Mammals, which we're also gonna talk about, people often think of mammals as the most advanced group. Mammals are certainly an advanced group of terrestrial animals i don't deny that but actually they're not as derived as things like reptiles and birds which means they don't have some of the more advanced characters we see in birds and reptiles actually and it turns out that when you classify reptiles that it's very hard for you to exclude birds from that group unless you really just want to do that outright so how important are these guys to stream ecology? Well, I was just doing this because I, I was thinking about it for birds and I did some simple calculations. And for this uh, kingfisher, which are common in our region, adults eat, let's say nine fish a day, which seems like a reasonable amount, sort of middling sized fish. You can see a good example of that there. That's actually a carp being taken away. And birds have to do this 365 days a year. They don't get any days off. They're small and they're hot. And so they have to spend a lot of energy maintaining that body. So they're going to require high amounts of energy even in the winter. And in fact, if anything, they'll probably require more energy in the winter, to tell you the truth, because they're going to be much, much uh, in a much colder environment that's going to drain heat from there much faster. And if you imagine that juveniles need in the order of another 8 to 11 fish per day and that there are between 5 and 8 of these in every single brood of uh, offspring that a pair of these kingfishers makes in a year, and a kingfisher might make two broods in a year, and they take about 30 days to raise, and you can start to estimate how many fish these animals actually need. So to raise a sort of small group of, a small brood to maturity will take around 1,800 fish, all right, so that's a lot of fish. To maintain just the adults in that area takes quite a few more. That's going to take another 6,600 fish, okay? And so for to feed one family of kingfishers in a year, you need about 8,500 fish. And 8,500 fish is a lot of fish. I don't care how you cut it. So when people go out and they catch some minnows for bait, and you think, wow, there's a lot of minnows. You know, they catch 100 minnows or something. Yeah, that is a lot of fish, certainly. And if they keep doing that one location, they'll deplete the minnows in that area, for sure. But in the grand scheme of things, is 100 fish a lot of fish? No, it's not. Even one group of kingfishers is probably eating more than that uh, in the, to just maintain themselves in one location on a stream. And so you can imagine if you're eating 8,500 fish in a stream, you're going to have pretty profound impacts, right? We've already talked about that fish can have impacts on the system. So if birds are removing them from a system or maintaining them at much lower abundances, then that's going to have really strong changes to the way in which those systems function. So then what is an amphibian? Well, an amphibian is a permeable skin animal, right? They have this cutaneous respiration. They have to breed in wet environments. Uh, they often feel sort of moist to us when we touch them, and that's because that skin needs to stay moist. They can be terrestrial, although even when they're terrestrial, they really like to stay in pretty humid environments. And you will find them in terrestrial systems. They're very common, uh, but you'll find them in leaf litter that stays nice and moist year round. All right. 
and they retain many of the primitive features that we see in early tetrapods. So they have some very cool features that allow us to look at some of the ways that uh, our own groups, our own group, I should say, managed to get onto the surface of the Earth and persist. And many amphibians, uh, especially salamanders, have a life cycle that's something like this, where there's a terrestrial adult. Uh, that should not surprise you at this point, right? That's very interesting. There is an aquatic larvae, right, that is emerges from an egg that the terrestrial adult lays in the stream or pond or in some some area near the stream and then that that larvae will live in the stream for some period of time and then it will move on to the terrestrial environment and finish growing there okay adults are quite happy to move into terrestrial or aquatic systems and quite capable swimmers but they may spend quite a bit of time actually moving around in the terrestrial environment they also have a very complex life cycle and just like aquatic insects it actually often includes a true metamorphosis where there is a real shift in what the animal does at one point and the body is modified to allow it to do something very very different uh, later in life so being an aquatic animal is a very different challenge from being a terrestrial animal one of the things this allows for is that larvae can often exploit habitat that is very different from adults. So there's less competition between adults and larvae. Larvae can be in one area and adults can be in another one. It also is good for the larvae because they're not running into adults all the time. And when you're small and soft, guess what? Your food. Uh, so it helps to limit some of the mortality that larvae have with, with adults. The diet is very dependent on the larger groups. Tadpoles are extremely herbivorous, and so we should expect that they're going to have large impacts on things like algae. Um, and salamanders actually are very carnivorous, and so we should expect that their impacts on systems are going to tend to look more like those insectivorous fish that we see in systems. Amphibians are certainly important for a variety of reasons. They can act as top predators. Here's a picture of a hellbender eating a snake. All right, so these they can get quite large. And if you go out to the Mississippi River, you will find hellbenders. They are very, very large uh, amphibians, and they are out there for sure. They are able to alter the abundance of prey species, especially things like crayfish. Hellbenders love crayfish, and they will consume enormous quantities of crayfish and actually reduce uh, the numbers of crayfish in a system. And crayfish are going to have knock-on effects, right? These are big, important animals. Amphibians are also in critical prey items as well, okay? So fish often eat amphibian larvae and are very, very happy to consume large numbers of them. And they, in turn, will sometimes limit uh, uh, amphibians themselves by consuming so many of their larvae. And as I already alluded to in the prior slide, amphibians, uh, or I should say frogs and their tadpoles can, and, and really tadpoles are important herbivores that can limit things like the amount of algae growing in a system. And they can change how fast that nutrient cycle through a system by moving it into an animal body faster and becoming prey for other things, okay? And the last thing I wanna point out that we often don't respect is the fact that salamander biomass can be as, a, as large as uh, birds and uh, mammals in headwater streams. All right, so these are really important members of these systems, even if you don't see them on a day to day. And anyone who's actually gone out and tried to sample for salamanders will know that these are not easy to sample for. There's a variety of reasons why that's the case. And so we often underestimate their biomass. And so people don't appreciate how important these guys are for systems. Beyond direct impacts, Amphibians are really important because they act as a, a warning sign, uh, a bioindicator is maybe a, a way to say it for systems. And they let us know if systems are functioning uh, without human impact. Amphibians are very sensitive to pollutants, to modifications and the natural uh, uh, patterns that we see in aquatic systems. And so when they are lost, it's a good indication that yes, human impacts are having a strong and detrimental effect on many of the species in this system. Now we may say, and this comes down to a decision we may make, we accept that in this area, right? We may say, well, we're gonna lose the amphibians here. That's just what we're gonna do. But we may also say we don't want to do that in, let's say, here, here, and here. So we need to modify our behavior. And we'll talk more about this when we get into restoration lecture. What is it that we are doing? What is the purpose of our restoration? Okay, we have to think about that.
And amphibians are especially useful as these bioindicators, as these bellwether species, because they have very permeable skin, and so pollutants are very easily entered into their body, and they exploit terrestrial and aquatic systems. So modifications or pollutants released in either system will immediately impact amphibians. So it's very, very useful. They also uh, can be useful if they live a long period of time, although that tends to be the case for reptiles more frequently because they usually live longer uh, and they can accumulate pollutants, things like mercury, right? Uh, and toxic materials within their bodies. What does that mean? So birds are actually a very, very modified reptilian body plan. And you may say, well, I, don't under I don't understand what that means. What are you actually saying? Well, I'm saying that a bird is effectively something like a flying lizard, okay? It's not a one-to-one, -one, but I want you to start to think of it like that. And if you don't believe me, look at a bird's legs. They're covered in scales, all right? So these animals, yes, indeed, they have feathers, very cool, but feathers are not something that prevents them from being a reptile. We often just think of uh, scales as being exclusive to the reptiles, but they're not, right? This is not a feature of reptiles alone. So when you say birds, you should really be talking about this group of feathery flying reptiles. That's fine. But if you then say reptiles and you exclude birds from that group, you're making a real mistake. All right. And it shouldn't surprise you that birds lay these nice eggs that also look a lot like eggs that you see in crocodiles and eggs that you see in lizards and eggs that you see in snakes. Right. These, they all share many of these common features. So what's a reptile then? How do we define reptile? Well, a reptile is an animal that produces what we call an amniotic egg. And that is, eggs don't necessarily need to be laid, just to be clear. Many reptiles actually give birth to live young. But it does mean that the larvae uh, is, has access to this thing called the amnion. All right, and that this egg is very, very useful in retaining water. And so amniotic animals are able to breed very far away from water. That's sort of an interesting component when you compare that to amphibians, which are very dependent on getting back to fresh water at some point to breed. Reptiles often have things like toenails and claws, all right? So they have these sort of protective scales over their digits. They also have scales along their body. And many of what we generally think about um, which is a, a, a modification of the uh, body surface is things like fur and feathers. So technically things like mammals are also, depending on how you define it, a reptile. There are two major groups of what we're calling reptiles then. We have the mammals and then the other ones, which are the sort of the lizardy like reptiles. But that lizardy group also includes birds. And the real definition is based on what the openings in the skull. Mammals belong to a group called the synapsids. And reptiles, the other group that we are putting here in quotes, and birds belong to a group called diapsids. I'm not concerned you know that, but I just want you to understand that when we try to define these groups, it can be a little bit harder than we actually initially think because often we look at members that are very, very advanced and we say, ah, there's no way this thing is anywhere close to this other thing. But as you start to move down the tree into more and more primitive members, you'll find that, man, those primitive members start to look a lot more like each other and actually drawing a line is really hard to do. In either case, many mammals and birds are endothermic. That's really interesting and really different than amphibians uh, and some of the other uh, animals that we see, especially fishes. And endothermy then is going to have really important impacts because endothermic animals are going to maintain highly active predation uh, during winter periods or they're going to have to leave the system. And so, for example, in this image, you have a blue heron eating a frog. I guarantee that frog was moving very slowly. Its metabolism was very, very low. It was probably consuming almost nothing. And it probably did that for months at a time. Whereas this blue heron largely is gonna be eating at the same rate that it did in the summertime, if not faster, because its prey items are moving much, much slower now, right? So there are real differences in the way in which these systems interact. I should say these species interact in the system because of this change in keeping the body warm or not. A lot of animals that we tend to think of in streams are exothermic, which means that their body is the same temperature as the environment around them. Let's talk about mammals then. Mammals have fur and they have hair and they produce milk, right? That's generally what we think of in the mammal, that's fine. Uh, and that's a good definition of them for what we're doing. Lots of mammals.
animals that we interact with in streams are actually herbiv herbivores, but there are a range of omnivores and carnivores as well that are probably important to stream ecology. Again, these uh, are hard to sometimes measure because we frequently think of them as terrestrial, uh, but there are plenty of other uh, ways in which they can interact with the system. Many of the mammals that interact in streams are burrowers, so they, they burrow or they build things uh, to live in. That's a common feature of mammals. They often live underground when they're a sort of small to medium size. And then very, very large mammals don't live below ground, but the, many of them uh, do use burrows at some point in their lifespan. Even things like mountain lions, right, still use things like caves as a, as a hangout. Okay, And because there are burrows and actively building of materials, they're going to modify the way that streams grow. And what I really like is this, not streams grow, streams flow, I should say. What I really like is this picture in the top right where you have access by a type of uh, herbivorous mammal on a nutria. You can see how much grass they're eating, right? They, this is called a denuded marsh. They've eaten all of the grass in that sort of stream system. And if you just exclude them, right, if you prevent them from doing that, lo and behold, uh, the grass is fine there, right? And that's going to have really profound impacts on that system. You can see the amount of open water in a denuded marsh is very different than the amount of open water in a normal marsh. It's also going to have impacts on erosion. It's going to have impacts on the way that the stream flows. You can see that when they are digging right down below, this is a picture of a burrow that has eventually collapsed and filled in. Those are going to create channels. They're going to speed up the velocity of water in those systems. They're going to tend to divert water around things because those channels are going to be far easier to flow through than lots of marsh grasses. The other one that we can often think about uh, is that uh, beavers, right? They make huge modifications to systems. And mammals are often very, very large, and many are carnivorous, so that's also important too. They're going to have these trophic cascade effects. But mammals are much larger than many of the stream residents we've thought about. Certainly an aquatic insect is a tiny compared to even very small mammals, right? We have some really important ones that we're going to cover. Beavers, bears, which you've actually already seen, nutria, which I just showed you to, and maybe even otters, right? Again, another carnivore that may have strong impacts. All of these are able to burrow or live underground at some point in their lifespan, or they build and modify stream systems very heavily. And again, they're hungry year round. Here's a good example of that. So in the picture above, there's a, there is a stream. You can see that standard meandering pathway. That's before beaver arrived at that system. That red dot is the same in both locations. And then after the beaver arrived, looked at how that meandering stream that was in a fairly obvious channel switches to this braided sort of pool system um, that doesn't have that strong channelization. Right? It's a really strong modification to this. Look at how that riparian zone has changed. It went from being very obviously uh, surrounded by uh, plants that probably got flooded occasionally to plants that need to be able to tolerate flooding probably continuously. Right? That's very, very different. That's going to make a very different system. Beavers don't live forever. Right? At some point, this beaver family is going to die. That, that modified system is going to be changed yet again. It may change back to what it was in the top picture. It may be taken over by other beavers. It may be expanded. Right? And so these are very different things that are occurring in the system because these mammals are present. And actually, if we just looked at beavers alone, they probably deserve their own lecture because they're so important. But they are, for us, let's hit on a few key things that are related to the importance of beavers and systems. They slow water flow substantially. They're going to reduce how much flood, how high floods get, okay, because they're going to create huge banks of sort of area that the water can, can flow into. And so they're going to create much lower flood heights because the water is going to spread out over very wide areas. And that, of course, is going to put them in conflict with humans right away. Letting a system be much wider means that properties are going to be flooded more frequently, although the flood height will be lower. But if you're a farmer, flooding of 12 inches, right, although it's not 24 inches, is really bad because that 12 inches is going to prevent you from planting. That's not a successful way to do business. So that's going to put you potentially in conflict with humans that are around you. They are also going to, by slowing this water down so substantially, are going to create areas that are going to collect a lot of silts and clays and sands, right? Because those are going to rain out as the water slows down. They're going to tend to increase stream temperature because they're making the water wide and shallow. And that's going to tend to provide lots of surface area for things to, to warm up in. 
they are absolutely going to provide refuges, right? They are going to provide built structures that things can hide in. That's woody debris that's entering the system by an animal. They're also going to be creating lots of habitat for things like macrophytes to grow into, and those provide a lot of refuge for organisms. They're going to make the system far more uh, dynamic, and they're also going to make it far more complex, that sort of mosaic landscape. It's not going to be a, str a simple stream channel anymore. It's going to be this really complex pattern that isn't even going to be static within its own location. It's going to be modified even day to day, hour to hour, and year to year. So it's going to make it even more challenging in some ways to understand. And of course, they're going to alter the riparian vegetation in a number of different ways. They're going to eat it, some of it, so they're going to select some. They're going to remove some and use that in their construction activities. They're going to flood other areas and select for some that can only survive in very, very flooded environments. They're going to tend to expand the flood zone, so they're going to tend to select for more wetland plants. So a lot of effects contained in just having these animals on the landscape. Bears also can have really strong effects. We've talked about them with salmon, right? And I want to stress this again, that bears eat a lot of fish and they can eat huge portions of a, of a run of fish. And that means that they're eating and, and moving nutrient into terrestrial systems. This is a bear eating a, a fish. They will usually, when they're eating during a run, they will eat just the fattiest portions of a fish and they will throw away the rest of the body because they're not going to waste time trying to eat portions that aren't super fatty. They're just trying to pack pounds on. So a lot of material is transported into the terrestrial system for other, for other animals to eat. All right. Now here's an example of that um, an adult, single adult male bear on Kodiak uh, ate enormous quantity, right, uh, of salmon, right? That's 6,000 pounds per bear per year. And maybe females eat half of that. Okay, 3,000 pounds. 6,000 pounds, right? You try to buy 6,000 pounds of salmon and see how much that costs you. That's an enormous amount of material that's being transported into these systems. So our bears going to have an effect on the streams they live in? Yeah, for sure. Even a couple of bears are going to substantially modify how nutrients flow around a system. And I just want to convince you, they actually do have this contest, Fattest Bear of the Year Award. This is the same bear, Bear 747, on the left. You can see that's in June. And by August, look how fat that bear is. That bear is grossly obese, right? But that bear is going to go through all that fat in the wintertime. In fact, if it's not that fat when it goes into hibernation, it may not survive hibernation. So packing on all that nutrient is going to be really important. And all that nutrient that's packed onto the bear is going to head into the terrestrial system, right? Because it's not going to make it to next year. It's going to be burned through to, to keep the bear alive. And all that waste product is going to end up in the terrestrial system. So it's a conduit of energy is another way to think of it. Let's talk about these reptiles and the scaly guys, what people usually think of when they think of reptiles. Again, this is a polyphyletic. So this is a pretty diverse group that's not a real biological grouping, but that's fine. We're excluding some an important member, that being the birds. But the important, the sort of unifying feature of what I'm thinking of when I think reptiles is exothermic animals. And they can be extremely, extremely important for stream ecology. If you live in Florida, this is already obvious to you and you don't have to watch the rest of this lecture. Uh, but for everybody else, you should be aware that uh, reptiles have profound impacts on the systems in which they are in. For instance, uh, alligators are really, really important in modifying and maintaining uh, streams and stream communities, in part because they're eating things. All right, that's fine. We get that. But in part because they also burrow, they dig, and they move around, and they create areas where animals can survive as water levels decline. So they create refuges in the landscape. They create a mosaic, right? They create a more dynamic landscape, more complex landscape. And that dynamic and complex landscape allows more species to live in it, and it provides refuge and protection and insulation against changes in the environment because there's sort of more backups, right? The odds that every single alligator pool will be uh, dried out is very, very low. The odds that uh, many streams will be dried out and all the small fish would be removed from those streams could be high in any individual year. But when you have a lot of backup systems, uh, then it's very unlikely these systems will change suddenly from year to year. So these uh, are often called ecosystem engineers because they have a disproportionate impact at the landscape level. We see that with alligators. You've actually already seen that used to describe sea lamprey, although I didn't use those terms. And it's often, often, often used to describe uh, beavers, which is fine. That's another good example of that. 
Turtles appear to matter too, although we don't have a good grasp on that. Uh, your reading does focus a bit on turtles. They don't really understand how they're how they are interconnected to things like food webs, but clearly they're important for connecting aquatic and terrestrial systems, and they lay huge numbers of eggs and live a long time, so clearly not many of them survive to adulthood, otherwise we'd be overrun with turtles. And so they must be transporting a lot of nutrients in and around the system. They're also, again, digging, so they're modifying these structures, uh, and they are eating a lot of other organisms, so they must have profound impacts on abundance uh, of certain types of organisms within these systems. Birds are the feathery dinos. Of course, birds are belong to the group of dinosaurs. Also have really important impacts. One of the things that's really important to understand about birds is not only are they endothermic, meaning that they're they're what we call warm-blooded, right? So they have to eat a lot year-round, but they are very migratory, so they're able to move around systems very easily. And that means that the pressure that birds exert on systems can be continuous and strong because if they have a, enter a system that does not have enough food to support them, they can move to another system and then exploit that one. And so those effects can be very, very powerful uh, because even if a system can't support them, they may still visit it to use it, all right? We find them in many aquatic systems. Certainly people are not unfamiliar with aquatic birds. They're very common in a number of things. They feed at all sorts of trophic levels. On the left, you can see a cormorant feeding on a large fish. You've got uh, a dipper there feeding on what looks like a pearl a day stonefly. And you've got ducks here that are dabbing, um, probably feeding on small macroinvertebrates, which are probably feeding on detritus, probably amphipods is what they're eating. But there could be other things in there as well. All right. So really interesting because of the way in which they interact with different levels of the stream. And I know that this isn't from a stream, but I wanted to show you that it can have really strong impact. So here's a cormorant uh, introduction into a lake. You can see when cormorants a lot arrive and then you can see immediately that the very large fish in the system start to decline. Right. And they move from this really erratic and higher abundances of those large fish to very, very low and relatively less uh, erratic uh, bouncing around the population. And that occurs very, very quickly in and around this point, right? There's a shift from a system that is features very high of variability in large fish over here, look at how variable that is, to a system that has much lower variability in fish but the abundance of those fish is also much smaller. And that's because these cormorants, right, are very abundant now and they're eating so many of those fish. But it's not that many cormorants, right? This is less than 400 nests, so that's less than 1,000 birds, and this isn't a lake. And just to convince you that this is a pretty big lake, right, there it is on the map. It's pretty easy to see with your naked eye, and that's a pretty big map. You can see that lake being impacted by cormorants is a substantial. That's 1,000 cormorants have that effect on the landscape. That's amazing. One of the cool things that I find really interesting is that fish size and habitat depth are really strongly related in streams. So if you're in really, really shallow environments, you're at huge risk from birds and mammals feeding on you. And that shouldn't surprise you. So we mentioned that birds and mammals can be very carnivorous. And if you're a very large fish, that's going to increase. So birds and mammals primarily target large fish. And that should also not surprise you because you do that when you go out fishing. You want the biggest fish in the stream. And the places where you're going to get them most easily are areas where you can see them in the shallows. So large fish will often be found in very, very deep habitats in part to limit their vulnerability to birds and mammals. But if you're in very deep habitats, right, because there are large fish there, then the risk to be eaten by a large fish goes up substantially. So deep habitats tend to be very, very high risk environments from fish predation. And so organisms are going to have to balance this. Shallow environments are going to make them exposed to birds and mammals. Deep environments are going to make them exposed to fish. And so they're going to have to maybe move back and forth or they're going to have to be uh, adept at avoiding one type of predator and then remain in a habitat where that predator is present. And that's very, very cool because that's going to modify the way in which organisms use the stream. So the stream is not equivalent for everybody everywhere all the time. And even if you don't get eaten, there's this important feature that is that fear is a powerful emotion and many animals have a clearly a fear or a startle response. This fish is demonstrating that. It's been removed from the water. It's doing a couple of things. One of them is that it's stretching all its fins out to try to prevent it from being eaten, in fact. So what it's doing is it's making itself look really long. It's actually sticking out all the hard bony parts of its body. In fact, it's pushing its gill cover up to do that. 
Uh, and that's because this is an anti-predation response. So you have captured this animal. It immediately responds by doing this. Well, that's very costly to do. It also prevents it from swimming very efficiently. And it also is not a great way uh, for it to conserve then calories, especially here, this is ice fishing during the winter time, right? And so if animals are afraid of being eaten, even if this animal doesn't get eaten, it's still gonna cost it something uh, to respond to that. And this is not the only way in which animals can have fear be an important element of their behavior. If they avoid an area because they think that there's a predator there, they may give up opportunities to eat, right? So they're foregoing potentially opportunities without having maybe even being so obvious that they were uh, uh, not getting that food in the first place. So this is really interesting because it also has effects in the size. Large organisms should behave less fearfully than small organisms because there's fewer things that can eat them. So they're gonna have a different sort of overall change in their behavior as a response to that. But these small and middling sized organisms are gonna have to be very careful. And so they may have very, very strong fear responses or that will provide uh, very different behaviors and very, mod very modified responses to the way in which they interact with their stream environment. In fact, some of the habitats which they may prefer to uh, utilize when there aren't predators around, maybe the exact habitats that predators key in on uh, and that use to try to capture them. All right, so that covers our amphibians and mammals, and I know, and, and I should say reptiles, and I know that uh, it's a little bit short, but I also wanted to stress that there's a lot of work to be done on these groups. Next up, we're going to do some modeling of primary and secondary production.